Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Madveya Muro, Director of Artistic Programs and Education at Self-Help Graphics and Art. Edgar, if you can please inform the group of the language interpretation. Welcome, everyone. Today's meeting will be conducted in English with live interpretation in Spanish. If you are a monolingual English speaker, please click the interpretation button at the bottom right of your Zoom screen. You will see a globe icon. Please click and choose English. If you are joining via Zoom smartphone app, select your language by clicking more or the three dots at the bottom right corner of your screen. Select language interpretation and choose English and press done. If you're a bilingual participant, choose any of the languages that are being offered. We ask our MC, speakers, panelists to also select the language in which you will be addressing our public. Everyone must choose a language. Do not stay in default off. Thank you. Bienvenidos a todos. La reunión de hoy será dirigida en inglés con interpretación en vivo y en directo en español. Si desea escuchar la traducción en español, por favor presione el botón de interpretación al pie y a la derecha de su pantalla Zoom. Verá el icono de un globo terráqueo. Favor de seleccionar Spanish. Si usted está uniéndose a nosotros vía Zoom en su teléfono inteligente, seleccione su idioma de preferencia presionando más o los tres puntitos al pie y a la derecha de su pantalla. Seleccione interpretación de idiomas y elija español y presione finalizado. Todos debemos seleccionar un idioma. Por favor, no se quede en apagado predestinado. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Marbella. Back to you. Thank you, Edgar. Again, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Marbella Muro, Director of Artistic Programs and Education at Self Help Graphics and Art. We begin by acknowledging that Self Help Graphics resides in Apachagna, currently known as the Los Angeles neighborhood of Boyle Heights, where the original peoples of this territory, the Tongva, Chumash, and Tataviam, were first displaced. We welcome you to this special program made possible by Art Rise, part of the We Rise month long initiative by the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. Today, we are here to share and celebrate the beautiful documentary created for Art Rise Vendedores en Acción, Vendors in Action. The film highlights the long term mental and emotional implications caused by, street caused by the street vendors' line of work their fight to legalize street vending and by COVID-19. Self-help graphics and art collaboration with the street vending community started in 2017 through its Jornaleros initiative, providing vendors uh, creative and design support to distinguish their businesses. And with the support of the California Arts Council, we continue our work with the street vending community in partnership with Inclusive Action and members of Vendedores en Acción, VEA, in 2019, we invited VEA members to vent at our annual Day of the Dead celebration and to prepare, participate in this, and participate in a series of art workshops with us. The storytelling approach and ideas stem to create a visual documentation about their lives, either through an exhibition or video interviews. When we were invited to participate in Art Rise, we realized this was our opportunity to make this idea happen. Our panelists include individuals behind the film and also a policy expert that will provide an insight into a new campaign introduced to, uh, to support the street vendors. I will introduce our panelists after the film. Now, i like uh, to prepare the screen to feature the film. Please, Alvaro. Thank you. As the film is getting set, I invite the viewers to please go to the top right corner of your Zoom screen and select the viewing settings to speaker view. Again, uh, the top right corner of your Zoom screen and select the viewing settings to speaker view. Thank you. Are we ready to go, Maria? Okay. Los vendedores 
Todo vendedor tiene una historia trágica. Quizá la mía fue un poco más, pero al final todos tenemos tragedias. Pero eso es lo que la ciudad no... Nos ven, digamos, no, no, no sé cómo nos ven, pero yo creo que deberían tomarnos en cuenta como seres humanos que sufrimos, que estamos luchando el día a día para conseguir lo que... para el sustento de nuestras familias. Nos gustaría que vean siempre abajo a los que estamos abajo y tomen conciencia de nosotros. trabajando por, un, por unos patrones que a veces los patrones pues nos tratan un poquito mal y dije Faustino qué haces trabajándole a un patrón estas manos échalas a andar los bolis los bolis los pollillos charamuscas los bolis la tradición de su país llegó a la puerta de su casa en este país hay oportunidad. Todo lo que uno fabrica, todo lo que uno hace, se vende. Desde que falleció mi esposo, fue cuando yo empecé a vender. Él, él falleció y pues yo tenía que salir adelante con, la, con mis hijos. Y fue cuando tomé la decisión de salir a vender. Aparte de mi trabajo, porque también tengo mi trabajo, tengo dos, dos trabajos. Porque pues ser, ser uh, padre y madre a la vez es, es difícil. que yo tenía que llegar desde el día viernes de mi trabajo a guardar lo, lo, el espacio para otro día vender porque venía otra gente y no agarraban los espacios. Aquí dormíamos. La gente que perdió el trabajo por esta misma pandemia, la desesperación de no traer dinero a su casa, ellos pensaron, tal vez, ¿verdad?, voy a vender y de esa manera, aunque sea, llevo el poquito a mi casa. Entonces, esos compañeros nuevos, cuando nosotros llegábamos, ya los encontramos. Y es muy triste esas horas de la mañana pelear con la otra persona, ¿verdad? Tampoco es mi estilo. Lo que hago de repente, sí. Le hablo poco a poco y le digo, mira, vamos a compartir ahora el espacio. Los Ángeles, al fin y al cabo, es grande. Le dije, pero los que estamos aquí estamos organizados. Hemos pasado tantas luchas, tantas cosas que hemos pasado. Toda esta gente que, está, que tú mires aquí estamos organizados. Ya tenemos nuestro permiso.
cuando yo empecé a vender aquí, aquí por la Brit y la César Chávez, yo me iba con mi carrito de marqueta y con mis dos ollitas de, de pozole. Y yo vendía mucho, pero llegó el momento que el policía sí me, me acosaba mucho, mucho. Y, y hasta que llegó el momento de que no nos dejaban vender. Policías aquí y policías allá. Y decían, la persona que se ponga a vender se, va a ir arrestada. Por eso, por eso, porque no has comido, no has comido. Yo te entiendo, porque yo también cuando no como así me pongo. Dijo, aquí no hay permiso y se le va a cobrar 1,500 de, de multa. Cuando a mí me quitaban mis cosas, me daba una tristeza que no te imaginas. No más que yo a mis hijas, yo nunca les demostré miedo. Y yo sola lloraba, porque mi material tenía que tener dinero para otro día. A otro día arreglaba el carrito de mi marqueta y con dos ollas de pozole a seguir adelante, a seguir adelante. A mí eso no me impedía nada. Cuando por primera vez que entramos al City Hall, o sea, la alcaldía que lo llamamos nosotros, tuve un poco de temor. ¿Por qué? Porque como inmigrante y entrar en un, oficinas de gobierno, como que da un poquito de... Pero nos agarramos el valor por parte de nuestros organizadores, por parte de los abogados, y que nos inculcan de que no tengamos miedo, porque tenemos derecho, estamos luchando por una causa limpia honesta, una causa de trabajo. O sea, no nos querían legalizar la venta ambulante. Y pues yo tomé la decisión, dije, pues lo voy a hacer por mis compañeros, lo voy a hacer. Pero yo siempre he confiado mucho en Dios. Y sí, fui, hice la desobediencia civil, no, sí nos arrestaron, sí nos, nos llevaron a la cárcel, pero pues gracias a Dios los abogados sí nos ayudaron y nos sacaron. Desde ese tiempo yo estoy con ellos. Yo cuando es al City Hall, que voy a Sacramento, que la lucha, que la marcha, yo siempre apoyo. Y eso lo ganamos. Nosotros fuimos a Sacramento y lo ganamos. Y gracias a eso pudimos sacar un permiso. Yo tengo mi permiso de venta. O sea, ya no tengo miedo porque antes, no, oh, que viene la policía, no, y a juntar las cosas y a correr por el ticket, ¿verdad? ¿Qué se buscaba? Este es un 30 por 30. Tengo 30. ¿eh? ¿36? Ok. Yo le doy gracias a, a la organización que por ellos nosotros estamos como estamos. Hay que decir lo que es. O sea, gracias a ellos estamos bien. Desde arriba. Uno, dos, tres. ¿Sí? Cuando empezó eh, la pandemia, 
nosotros todavía no creíamos. Pero de repente empezaron en las noticias a elevarse las muertes, las muertes. La verdad, dije, Dios mío, ¿qué es esto, verdad? Yo dejé de vender el día 16 de marzo. Ya la siguiente semana de marzo, este, dijo esta, esta Nuri Martínez, no se va a poder vender, que vendan los vendedores. Los vendedores que estén vendiendo, se le va a cobrar mil el ticket. Quédate en casa. Empecé, empecé a meditar. Ok. Como hispanos, como inmigrantes, somos obedientes. Quedarnos en casa. Pero a través de la trayectoria vienen los resultados. ¿Cómo vamos a comer? ¿Cómo vamos a sustituirnos? ¿Cómo vamos a pagar la renta? ¿Cómo vamos? Todo vino en la mente. Lamentablemente, yo, yo soy de las personas, como les decía, que me come en mi casa. Y sí me salía afuera un rato a estar con mis animales, eh, con, mis, con mis plantas. Cuando salía afuera, nadie de mis vecinos estaban, todo cerrado, todo en silencio. La verdad era muy triste, muy, 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 muy triste. Pues, como a todos los compañeros, nos ha afectado bastante, tanto en lo económico y tanto en lo, en lo mental, porque muchas personas han quedado, quedaron muy mal a raíz de esto. A mucha gente les dio el COVID. A mí me dio también incluso amigos. Pues mira, la situación pues, se puso muy, como te puedo decir, muy trágica para los vendedores, pensando que hay, hay un gran negocio, pero la gente, como empezó la pandemia, se alejaron de los negocios. Y los vendedores se arriesgaron, aún así, por la necesidad de querer trabajar, de llevar algo a, su, a sus hogares y nos contagiamos muchos vendedores. Algunos fallecieron, muchos compañeros han muerto. Pues, y la verdad que te voy a decir, durante toda esta etapa de la desgracia que me pasó, pues me refugié en la música. Para mí fue el escape a mi, a mi dolor. Esta canción va dedicada para ti, hija. Yo sé que me vas a escuchar donde estés. Hermoso cariño. Hermoso cariño, del cielo ha llegado y que me ha colmado de dicha y amor. Precioso regalo, precioso regalo, y estoy como un niño con un nuevo juguete contento y feliz. No puedo negarlo y quiero gritarlo. Hermoso cariño que Dios ha mandado no más para mí. Me han pasado muchas cosas. Ha pasado mucho tiempo, pero siempre el recuerdo está ahí 
Yo he escuchado siempre que la vida te da y te quita. Y a mí me quitó lo, lo que más quería. Pero pues yo me, me refugié en la música, la lectura y el trabajar en la organización, apoyar a mis compañeros. ¿Para qué utilizar estos fondos? Marque todas las casillas que apliquen. Renta, comida, biles. Renta, comida. ¿Usted o alguien en su hogar ha contraído coronavirus? Sí, él. Okay. Ya. Se completó, doña. Los bolis, los hielitos, las congeladas, los bolis. Los helados. Los bolis. Uno como vendedor que tiene un conecte y, y contacto con el público, se siente uno encerrado. Así yo siempre que me llamaban, les decía yo estoy como un león en la jaula. Ahora falta de que uno se enferme por el COVID, viene por la tristeza de no tener ese conecte con el público, porque nosotros estamos con el pueblo y sin el pueblo no hay alegría y siempre en la calle vamos a, a alegre al menos yo voy alegre cuando tú estás vendiendo ¿Sabes cuál es tu satisfacción? De que gente que no podemos salir a nuestras tierras y que te digan, gracias a usted yo como las quesadillas de mi mamá. Gracias a usted yo me como esto. Y es una satisfacción tan hermosa. ¿Por qué? Porque no podemos salir. Pero sí tengo el gusto de comerme lo que, lo que hacía mi madre o lo que hacía mi abuela. Y esa es su satisfacción también que están dándole a tu comunidad y que no han perdido su cultura. Compañeros, ¿Cómo estamos? Bien. Bien. Muy bien, vamos a repasar esta canción. ¿Listos? Listos. Listo. Vamos.
hear me now? Okay, sorry about that. So uh, welcome back everyone. I'm honored to have friends joining us today. We begin with film, film director Alvaro Para. Also with us is Caridad Vasquez, a longtime street vendor and advocate and member of VEA who makes delicious quesadillas on the corner of Breed and Fourth Street. So after tonight's talk, please go and, um, and see her. We also have musician and senior organizer uh, at Community Power Collective, Quetzal Flores, who composed the music score and guided Vea through a beautiful collaborative songwriting experience to create the, the anthem that which you heard in the film. And finally, we have Lyric Kilkar, policy director and inclusive action for the city and is joining us today to talk about the new initiative introduced to the city uh, that would benefit the street vendors. So we'll begin with um, Alvaro. So Alvaro, can, um, you know, we, we spoke about the goals for this um, film. Can you talk about your approach to the film and your thought process to capture the individual stories, um, not only uh, the whole story of the street vending community. Yes, uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for this event. Thank you, Self Help Graphics. Thank you, We Rise. It's been a, a really beautiful experience making this film. And thank you, first and foremost, to Vendedores en Acción. Um, speaking about the process, the process was one in which getting to know the street vendors and establishing a, a trust and a relationship was paramount. And so before bringing any cameras out to the locations where all of the vendors work, um, I just visited them several times and we had long conversations and we got to know each other and little by little um, through their conversations, I would just make mental notes in my mind about what I felt was going to be really important, relevant and honest about the hard and sacrificing work that street vendors across Los Angeles do. So it was a process of really getting to know them, number one. Um, you know, each, each individual has their own unique stories. And um, so what were the challenges you faced to filming the documentary? This is an ensemble piece, right? We, we, we profile six different vendors with very different stories. Um, Two of our vendors, Santa and Humberto, are from Peru. The rest of the vendors are from Mexico. And, and this is just a, a small demographic portrayal of what are thousands and thousands of street vendors across the city of Los Angeles. And so our task as filmmakers was to find the right balance between telling their personal stories, telling the occupational hazards of their stories that they all share in some way, the sacrifices of street vending, the dangers of street vending. And yet we had an added challenge, which was to answer questions about the pandemic and how the pandemic had affected their line of work. And so the hardest challenge was balancing all of these elements and still telling a story, right, in the end. And so that was the hardest challenge. And I, I really want to thank my crew. I want to shout out my crew, our director of photography, Andrea Gonzalez Mereles, and our sound recordist and sound mixer, Sandra Perez, who we were a tight crew, just three people. And we were all doing multiple jobs. But I think that it was key in keeping things low key and intimate and, and having a very close relationship with, with all the vendors. I think also one of, um, I assume that one of those challenges in filming as well was the um, the actual locations. I mean, um, I know where Caridad has her her stand. You know, she's by herself in that location, while the uh, many other vendors are down on Main and like Forty Six and Forty Seventh, and it's row after row. Um, did you find and, and very tight? sidewalks were the, there are some challenges there definitely yeah there's a lot of action going on right um there's a vibe there's a pulse going on 
from where Santa works in downtown LA to where Caridad works in Boyle Heights to where the rest of the vendors operate here, as you mentioned on 46th and Main, 47th and Main. Each place has its own pulse. Um, we were lucky to have the green light from the street vendor community because of these meetups and because of the actual street vendors who um, were kind enough to inform everyone that we were gonna be coming, that there was gonna be a camera crew. So in reality, the, the, um, the other street vendors and, and the public and the environment in general was very welcoming. And I think it was a matter of how we approached the process of getting to know folks first and getting the green light from our, our street vendor subjects themselves and them helping us out in a sense as, you know, as producers. And, you know, it's, I think it's, it's also important to mention that the documentary idea is really one that is born from the street vendors. Um, if you want to mention something about that, Marbella, you know, you and I have had a lot of conversations regarding that, of course, but it was, it was their idea to tell their stories through a documentary. And so they've been very involved in the process throughout. Yes, um, as I mentioned earlier, it, it was there that we were doing workshops um, in preparation to decorate um, or enhance the stance that they had at the Day of the Dead in 2019. And yeah, it's it just, we met, I think like three days in a row, uh, like each week. And I think in a, a span of two or three weeks and it was just a lot of conversations. And at one of their meetings, they meet, uh, every Wednesday and also Monday, meet Mondays and Wednesdays and at one of the meetings with a former, um, uh, I guess, uh, staff or person that worked with them. Um, she also informed me, Michelle, you know, this is something that we're thinking about, you know, how can you help us? And so again, this, this opportunity came. And so I'm, I'm very happy that, that this, we do have this opportunity. I want to also um, ask you, can you share with us uh, any moments that you experienced uh, of surprise or in making the film or just moments that still linger with you? Mm -hmm. There are several. Um... There are many emotional moments in, in the film. Yes. I, have to, I have to definitely uh, bring up the scenes that we shot with Don Humberto in the cemetery where his daughter and his grandson are buried. And he was generous uh, and, and really opened himself up to this tremendous vulnerability to invite us to document what a normal visitation is like for him. And um, we were all crying during the filming of some of those scenes. And, you know, that is not something that happens normally on a, on a film set. But again, because of the nature of this process, it's very intimate. We, we get very close with, with uh, the people that we're documenting. And so uh, this, was, this was very emotional for all of us. And so for the, the crew involved, you know, many folks have said, you know, the, the scene where, where Don Humberto sings Hermoso Cariño really brought me to tears. We were, we were there as well uh, in that same emotional space. And um, the other really special, I think, piece of, of this film is the music space created between Quetzal and the vendors and the creation of this of this song space, this music space that we shot inside of self-help graphics, it was the only time that we shot the group together. And to be able to come together and sing a song and do several takes of it. And, you know, we had a full film crew that day and to shoot it on 16 millimeter film, all of these things coming together, it was just a really special energy that night. It was a really beautiful coming together. I also want to take this moment to acknowledge Marta. Um, Gonzalez, the singer, she was in excruciating pain and, you know, she, she, you know, sang through with such grace and a smile. So, um, yeah, 100%. There was, there was, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, there were a lot of moments in, in the film that, you know, that brought me to tears. And I'm going to ask Caridad in, in the bit about one of those moments when I, I get to her um, in the next questioning. But before I do so, I want to ask a question for both Alvaro and Caridad. Um, can you share a moment that stands out 
uh, for both of you uh, on the day that you filmed together? The day that we shot at Caridad's stand. With, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want me to go first? Okay. Um, yeah, for me, it was the connection that Caridad has with her customers. It's the feeling that these folks are very frequent, you know, visitors to, to, to Caridad stand. The rapport that she has with them, the jokes, the laughing, you know, there's a real affection between Caridad, the way she talks to, to all her customers. Meanwhile, multitasking over this grill, right? And handling probably two or three orders at the same time. Um, I was really, I was really moved by that. I was impressed by that. And then she walks over to us and gives us a tremendous 40 minute interview, you know? So uh, just her, her, her gusto, uh, her passion and that, that real affection and connection that she has with, with her customers is what truly stands out to me. Thank you, Alvaro. Oh, Carida, this is gonna be so difficult speaking to you in, in English. <laughs> But um, can you, can you, um, I know you've meant, you've shared with me when I, I brought up the idea of, um, okay, we're going to do the documentary. Uh, it's it's going to happen. Um, Lulu, Lulu is going to help you right now. Sorry about that. We're going to help uh, Caridad unmute. Okay, so uh, you mentioned before that bueno, you pues antes que nada, pues, sí. oh, no. Gracias. Pues, ¿qué más puedo decir de Álvaro? Es fue una, una experiencia muy bonita. También la confianza que nos dan ellos también para poder participar en lo que el, el trabajo que hemos hecho todos estos años y en qué forma ellos tratan de, de dar esta información a, a, toda, a toda información que se está ahorita accediendo a la tecnología. Para, para que se den cuenta cómo nosotros trabajamos y a la vez este, estamos atrás de un, como de un sentimiento, una tristeza de que pues sufremos, pero damos la cara a la gente, a las personas que estamos bien y que seguimos adelante. Y de todos gracias Álvaro, buen trabajo. So, Carida, I, I know you've uh, been part of two documentaries. Can you tell us what was different about this documentary and the two other ones that you've been you've I know you you know we watched the the documentary as a group with the VAM members and some family and now uh, this time again can you share uh, a little more about your your feelings about it sí pues antes que nada pues mi nombre es Caridad Vázquez soy vendedora aquí en Boyo Heights y pues lo que acabo y lo y lo he y les voy a decir que yo he hecho dos, este, dos, dos, este, dos, dos documentales y este son tres. Pero el que me llegó más es este, porque aquí este documental nos llegó al humanitario de lo que somos los vendedores. ¿Cómo sufremos? ¿Cómo llegamos a vender el sentimiento, el dolor de cada de nosotros? Y sin embargo, seguimos adelante. Y Álvaro, yo tantos años que he estado con mis compañeros, ahora en este documental, vi que cada de nosotros teníamos una tristeza tan profunda que solamente nosotros sabemos cómo seguimos viviendo adelante, a pesar que hemos sido acosados siempre, siempre porque vendemos nosotros en la calle. Pero ellos no saben que nosotros, que esto lo que estamos haciendo es una lucha para seguir trabajando legalmente. Porque esta lucha no es una lucha como cualquiera, esta lucha es un sentimiento que siente uno. Porque yo he sabido otras historias, he, he oído otras, otras, este, otras luchas, pero la de nosotros no se compara. Y les voy a decir por qué. Porque cada de nosotros que están escuchando nuestro documental, cómo sufremos en, en nuestro cuerpo, en nuestro sufrimiento. Porque nadie sabe que es un vendedor, el elotero, eh, nomás voy a comprarme un elote, no, pero no sabe lo que lleva el elotero, cómo sufre, cómo deja a su familia, ir a vender o no ir a vender. Y eso la sociedad no se da cuenta, de cada vendedor cómo sufremos salemos a vender. 
Y ese es el sentimiento que yo tengo hacia, ¿por qué no nos, no nos ayudan todavía a seguir legalizando bien nuestra, nuestra, nuestro, nuestro puesto de seguir adelante? Porque esto de vender es algo que a pesar que ganamos, estamos haciendo acosados todavía. Y eso es lo que a mí me, me da tanto sentimiento, porque yo escogí ahorita este documental, compañeros, tantos años que he estado viéndolos, y hasta ahorita estoy escuchando las historias de todos nosotros. ¿Qué serán de las personas que ya no existieron, que sufrieron anteriormente? Porque yo soy testiga que muchas personas murieron por este, este, este sufrimiento que estamos sufriendo nosotros los que vendamos en la calle, por acoso. Hemos, han fallecido muchas personas y yo soy testiga. ¿Eh? Y eso no se da cuenta la sociedad. No sabe. Pero ya es tiempo que sepa lo que es un vendedor. Pues no somos cualquier vendedores, también es tenemos nuestra historia, nuestro peso, nuestras vidas, nuestro sufrimiento. Eso es lo que tiene que saber la sociedad, cómo vivimos. No se dan cuenta. A caridad, este, uno de los um, momentos que uh, este, a mí me tocó mucho, oh, sorry, English, <laughs> sorry about that. One of the moments that really touched me was It, 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 it turned the light on in my head that I didn't recognize before or didn't acknowledge before is that the comment you made that be cut through the food that is sold um, by street vendors, we get to have a little bit of um, our home back in wherever that may be, or whatever country that may be. And it, it just like gets on to me like, oh, that's true, that's true. And, and on top of that, those conversations that come with um, that engagement with the vendor, it, it just, it's so special. And, and that was one of the moments that really, that really hit me too. And um, I want to also ask, I know you, uh, your daughters, um, one of your daughters help you with the preparation of, uh, and also at the food stand. Um, I, I, I'm really curious to know What was the conversations you had with your family like after this, after you, you, you um, shot the film and also like now seeing the film? What, uh, and your, I know your daughter came with her family to see the film. What were the conversations you had? Pues, las conversaciones que hemos tenido con mis hijas que están tan, este, ¿cómo se llama? Están bien, este contentas por lo que el trabajo que he hecho y lo que siempre voy a seguir adelante porque este puede ser un futuro para ellas. Y, sa, y como lo acaba de decir Marbella, la comida de nosotros no va a desaparecer mientras que nosotros existamos. ¿Por qué? Porque muchos salemos y muchos no salemos y se quedan. Y la, y la, la satisfacción de cada, los que vendemos, comen su cultura como salvadoreños, peruanos y todo eso. Ellos no pierden su paladar de su cultura y sin embargo con nosotros todavía tienen su conocimiento de su comida. Esa es la satisfacción que tenemos todos los que vendemos. La comida, lo, los que venden ropa, los que venden, todos, cada de nosotros tenemos nuestra, nuestra, la cultura de lo que vendemos de cada país. Entonces, eso es lo que, la satisfacción de, de cada uno de nosotros. Mis hijas están contentas porque me dicen, mamá, se te logró tu sueño, sigues luchando y pues lo único que te decimos es desearte mucha suerte porque esto va a, ser, va a ser para un futuro, podemos seguir adelante nosotros y no nomás nosotros, sino para otras personas como tú que no, deja, que no, no, dejas, no dejaste caer esta campaña, la seguiste a pesar que tuviste muchas trabas, estuviste, pero no nomás yo, sino a toda a todas las organizaciones, a todas las comunicaciones, a toda la tecnología, a todas las personas que nos apoyaron. De veras, yo estoy tan contenta y de veras lo, de, lo deseo de corazón que nos sigan apoyando porque nuestra lucha va a seguir. Va a seguir. Speaking about the fight and advocacy, I want you, you are one of six people um, in there or, and, you know, and Can you talk about how um, they are formed and walk us through how the group makes decisions together? Because I know it's a very collaborative process. Pues, pues mira, vean, 
cuando se nosotros se ganó, en el 2018 cuando se ganó la, la, la legalización, este, gracias, aquí está Quetzal de Testigo, que se, que se, que se iba a ser una organización para los, vendedores, para los vendedores. Pues yo en ese tiempo, yo no sabía que era una organización, yo no sabía, nomás sabíamos que pues, iba, hasta que ya después nos dijeron que una organización de, 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 íbamos a depender como de cualquier, como cualquier trabajo para unir vendedores, como juntarnos, platicar el proceso de un futuro. Entonces, apenas este, yo, porque no creas que soy tan, tan abierta en mi cabeza, pero voy a poco a poco entendiendo. Pero ya sé que ahora que he estado, ya tengo tres, dos, tres años en esta comunicación, me estoy dando cuenta que en un futuro que yo, yo y mis compañeros queremos que vea exista que sea una organización de, de mucha fuerza, de mucha fuerza. Porque esta, esta organización, lo vuelvo a repetir, no va a ser cualquier organización, porque es sentimiento de todos nosotros. Es una, una organización de, 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 de todos los que hemos vendido y de los que hemos sufrido. Y yo lo que quiero es que en un futuro florezca mucho y siga, que ya no sigamos, que ya no sigamos como años anteriores, que viene la policía, que corríamos, que esto y lo otro, que ya no que ahora ya tengamos más libertad de hablar, de hablar, decirles, tenemos derechos también. Yo, de, yo, y como le hemos platicado y le hemos discutido a los compañeros, vea, va a ser un futuro para todos los vendedores, pero futuro que nunca vamos a dejar que cualquier llegue y nos oprime. Va a ser una organización como cualquiera. Y a lo mejor, a como vamos, porque yo soy una de esas, yo no tiro toalla. Yo quiero lo mejor de vea. Y que mis compañeros les he dicho, echarle ganas para arriba. Porque esto es la, la, la organización de BEA va a ser para el futuro para más de 5 mil vendedores que necesitamos aquí en Estados Unidos. Y a dar la más información que se pueda, ¿cómo se va a crear, cómo, cómo se va a crear BEA? Ese es mi, mi, mi pensamiento, que yo no voy a dejar BEA. La um, final pregunta uh, for for you, Calida, before we transition to uh, with Quetzal, is um, I know you talked about thinking, um, or you talked about how you think about uh, the future of VEA, but can you tell me uh, if you as a group, and I, I'm going to touch this more on the anthem, uh, the VEA's anthem, but can you share what the group thinks um, or envisions VEA 10 years from now? How it envisions VEA 10 years from now? Pues como lo dice la canción, no hay que dejarnos, seguiremos luchando. Que nadie, nadie no, 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 nos oprime. Porque la, el himno lo dice claramente, que vamos a seguir luchando y vamos a trabajar. Y sobre eso, 10 años, primeramente Dios, que Dios me deje llegar, decir, ya estamos aquí. Y no es vamos a esperar 10 años, vamos a esperar 2, 3 años, porque yo tengo fe que Bea va, va, va a florecer y vamos a trabajar. Para mí, Bea va a ser un, este, un este, ¿cómo se llama? Una organización que espero que una vez lo dije y lo vuelvo, soñaba mucho hace 12 años, ya no sueño. Ya estoy despierta. Aquí estoy. Y aquí estamos todos los vendedores. Y vea en acción. Te escuchamos. <laughs> Quetzal, can you, um, I know uh, both of you have shared with me that you've known each other for a long time. Can you share um, how that relationship began and uh, a little bit of, more about that? Yeah, so I, I met Gary in, in about 2012. Uh, as part of the Building Healthy Communities uh, Initiative, the California Endowment, and street vending was one of the focuses of the uh, of Building Healthy Communities at the time, one of the work groups, the neighborhoods work group. <clears throat> and so uh, I met Gadi through that, and we developed a, a strong bond, um, just a personal bond. And you know, I, I I feel like that's that's a really important piece to to everything that I've done with with this group is is that I uh, I feel like Gadi and I have a relationship. We have a critical connection. And uh, based on that critical connection, we're able to do things and uh, and, and and build things together. 
So going back to the topic of collaboration, um, can you talk about the creation of the anthem? What was the impetus for the song? Sure. So, so at CPC, um, we're always thinking about um, ways to to engage um, with with um, different members of, of of the base and ways to center ourselves in their struggles uh, and to really be led and guided and led by by their work. Um, and so the street vending team, uh, Sergio Jimenez, Rosa Miranda, and, and Carla de Paz, um, are always pushing me to, to figure out ways to, to jump in, right? And so um, I know that they were like, okay, can, can, we, can we do a songwriting workshop with Bea? Uh, and this was right when the pandemic hit, and so it had to be via Zoom, which was not comfortable for any of us, because we we love to see each other in person, we love to to spend time together and and get dirty, you know, and so, um, so it was it was hard, but I feel like it was also um, it was very uh, important and fruitful, and uh, and it was also uh, I have to mention that it was it's also part of a collaboration that that Community Power Collective has with. Um, with the Alliance for California Traditional Arts called Sounds of Sounds of Boyle Heights, Sounds of California Boyle Heights, mm -hmm. and so um, so we we did this songwriting workshop via Zoom, and they 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 came with it, and, and we had the luxury of having gone through a year long process of building the organization, of building agreements to how. Uh, the organization, the organization was going to move forward. Of building bylaws, of building a, 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 a two-year budget. You know, we did a lot of work to to begin to set up the organization, Bea. And so we had all of that time and, and those relationships, that time spent, to to stand on. And so then, when when the questions came, they were just, you know, and and, they were, and it was hard because they weren't vending. Yeah. And you you could you could feel the stress and the pain and the desperation and 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 we have to to you know recognize and, and appreciate that they were willing to and able to participate in a space like that and and to think about writing a song when it's like they could have been like esta cancioncita que like how is that gonna, this how is this song going to put food on my table how is this yeah. song going to put you know but no they understand the bigger picture and and they were willing to go through it and so. Um, so the song, the way it's structured, is is really powerful. It's a it's a powerful narrative, and I I would I want to invite folks to to be able to read it, you know, just as as a as a, as a literary document. And there's tons of of important information in there that they, that they've packed into, and it's all their words. And um, and in the end, you know, I came up with some music, and you know, I was giving them a little taste of it and my son was here and Martha was here and we were we were you know given like okay how about this and then they were like uh nah like we want something more lively like we want yeah. we want to feel alive that's depressing <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to we had to redo retry something else with the music and they're like yeah that's it and and you know I always think about uh, Santa and and Umberto when we're doing these things as well. And I know how much Umberto loves the cajon. I know how much he loves Peruvian music. And so I tried to, to give him a, a little bit of the Peruvian stuff as well, as well as keeping like, you know, the Mexican root intact and, and, and just kind of making a, a, sound, a sound that is representative of them as well. And so that, that was basically the process. Yeah. I, um, before I didn't realize that I was, um, or you can hear me, that was a thing that I mentioned, how catchy and lively that song is. And it stays, it, I mean, after you recorded the, the film here, I think I sang it, I sang it um, for days and I know I'm gonna be singing it the rest of the night because it's just, it's so exciting. And I think that also going back to the film, the way Alvaro ends it, I mean, these are um, very, uh, hard stories and experiences that each person um, has has and continues to experience. But when you have this song and you know the you hear the lyrics and then the beat, it just 
it makes you feel like you kick ass. You can kick ass and you keep moving forward. And it, it's, it's just, I think it's such, I don't know, um, it's such an uplifting um, song that really represents their spirit. Yeah, and part of the, the function of music in society has always been to, to lift the spirit, to have cathartic moments in, in community, right? Uh, and so part of the, the, the whole function of collective songwriting, this method that we bring, is that we are, are offering a different way to process feelings, to process, uh, um, you know, ideas in collective and that we can come up with a collective narrative that then gives us direction on how to move forward. Like you asked Gadi a question right now about like, what's next, right? And she's like, well, like the song says, right? Yeah. Well, there it is. And so this is the function of music. Music has a way of really, uh, of really articulating one, the unspoken, but also articulating what's necessary to say. Mm -hmm. um I, my, one of the questions was about the challenges, but of, of, of uh, recording uh, mm -hmm. virtually or doing the songwriting vir uh, virtually because we are people in, was it comunidad, like in, in, you know, we love the in-person experience. Um, do you think that the song kind of may have shifted to some, uh, or may have developed uh, in a different way than it would have in person? Probably, probably, but I will say that the intimacy that was created previously, and like I said, those mentioned those critical connections and the relationships that we have allowed us to kind of create that imaginary, mm -hmm. right? And so that imaginary allowed us to, to, to continue to be in community and, and know, and you know, you hear someone's voice and that sound elicits a feeling, that sound elicits a response. And so every time I hear Gadi's voice, I can be, you know, far away, but I hear her voice and I feel something, you know, and so it's that same thing. And so I, I feel like we had the benefit of having the relationship prior. Had we not had that, that time together, that time spent, uh, it would be very, very difficult. Yeah. Thank you, Ketzal. And Lyric, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I know you were away when we extended the invitation. So again, oh. I'm very uh, thankful for your presence. Uh, one of my main motivations uh, to push this production, the production of this film is to amplify the vendor stories and to elevate their support. Inclusive action for the city has been a champion for the vendors rights. Can you please talk about the new LA street vendor campaign uh, that was in, or recently introduced? but I know they've been yeah. working on for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. So the work of the LA Street Vendor Campaign under that umbrella um, has continued after their major goal to legalize street vending that came about in 2018 and 2019. And the campaign started back, I believe it was in like 2008 or 2010. And, and it's had many partners uh, throughout that time. But the same folks are leading that work and vendor leaders such as Cari, Humberto, Santa, and Faustina, who we saw in the video, um, as well as a number of others have really been the backbone. And my organization, Inclusive Action, Community Power Collective, Public Council, and East LA Community Corporation have been um, um, true champions of the work as well. Um, in terms of the policies, the hard part with the legalization having happened in 2018, 2019, uh, and then the decriminalization at the state level around the same time, is that food vendors are still effectively illegal because the food permit process is so hard to get through. There's only a handful of vendors who are fully permitted that sell food when there's an estimated 10,000 across the country. Um, we do have a handful, like a, a bunch of different buckets of work that have happened over the last year. And so I'll say that when COVID hit, um, we saw that vendors were completely left out. And we saw that in, in the film as well, you know, and often they were targeted by enforcement and a lot of our work responded to that. So at the city level, we worked with vendors and council offices to retract the moratorium on street vending that occurred almost immediately when the city shut down. And especially, while they were being targeted by enforcement. This also catalyzed the development of the Street Vendor Emergency Fund, which the, the um, 
a video focuses on or, or talks about, and it distributes cash cards to vendors across LA County because they were left out of all of the other major relief efforts for other small businesses. At the county level, we are still trying to decriminalize any citations from the health department. So that's for food vendors. It was pretty startling how quickly the Department of Public Health said to the public that they that um, the public should instead report vendors for not being permitted, even though there isn't any research or anything at all showing that street food is unsafe in any way. And so it was very quick to, to turn to criminalization and further enforcement instead of support as they deserve and they need. And then at the state level, we have a few things going on. The first is the advocacy around getting a $50 million fund to go directly to sidewalk vendors across California in the form of $5,000 grants. We're also looking into what the barriers are at the state level that make it so difficult for vendors to get their health permits. So the things that the county, there, there are things that the county itself can change to help get health permits, but there's also changes at the state level that need to happen in order for it to truly work for vendors. And I'll mention that the codes were really written for brick and mortar businesses and food trucks and street vendors are just obviously a different type of business and their needs are different and their, their practices are different. And like I mentioned, no research showing that the food is unsafe in any way. And in fact, actually the bulk of foodborne illnesses come from brick and mortar restaurants. And so in order for the code to be health promoting, we need to right size it to like, to, to reflect the, the way that vendors operate because it's obviously in a healthy way. Folks are not getting harmed in any way from the food, you know? Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is that outside of all this, we are working with the county on a pilot program uh, to help develop blueprints for a code compliant cart and also provide education, outreach and technical assistance for vendors so that we can help them get their permits. And we're really excited about this program because we're hopeful that at the end of it, we'll have um, at least the beginnings of a more equitable ecosystem for sidewalk vendors in LA County. Um, although street vending is legalized, like uh, you mentioned, and, and, the, and the, it's challenging, the process is challenging. Um, the fees are also scheduled to increase, I think that's next month. What can the public do to respond to this? Um, is there something like the public can do to, or write to uh, a city council or, or state legislation to, um, I guess, prevent the continuous increase of, of fees? Yeah, absolutely. That's such an important point. So as, as we talked about, the permit process is exceedingly challenging. And um, they extended this lower permit fee about a year ago, but so little has changed in the past year that it didn't do what it was supposed to do to try and get folks on board. Um, this, is, this is something that absolutely individuals can weigh in on and that's by calling your council members. So call the city of LA council members, tell them that you want a lower permit fee. And frankly, we think it should be a free permit. Like they should not be paying for this permit. Um, so little has been done to support street vendors, and they were some of the hardest hit businesses from the pandemic, as we saw in the film. And all sorts of fees and exceptions have been made for brick and mortar businesses, and new programs have been developed to support them. So the same needs to happen for vendors. They like Vendors are cultural gems of our neighborhoods, and we need to protect and support them. So calling your council member, and also you can submit public comment to the council file. Um, I, I'd be happy to explain that process. It's a little bit more complicated than it should be, but uh, that is, those are two of the major ways you can help to, to uh, push city council to keep a lower permit fee or make it free altogether. Lyric, what I would ask you is if you can maybe give us a, or mail uh, me and email me a description that we can then share on our social media to make that push of how Absolutely. to, um, and then also uh, from the email that was shared um, for the, this uh, LA city, uh, the city of LA uh, initiative of uh, towards the uh, $50 million, I think it's the grant, correct? Um, you were seeking organizational support. So how can organizations continue to support this campaign, but also on the, on the, um, 
uh, for individually, how can individuals um, who are not part of these other or large organizations or who may not be in an organization that would extend themselves to support, how can individuals support um, the street vendors? Yeah, great campaign? question. So the, the, this $50 million fund is at the state level and the state, state is level, looking right. to do it across California. And there's a couple of things. So we do have a, a social media toolkit we would be, we can share. I can share it in the chat if that's helpful. Yes. Um, we also have a petition for individuals to sign. And what that does is when you sign the petition, it automatically sends an email to the different elected officials who are making these decisions. And then the last thing, as you mentioned, is this organizational sign-on. Here are all the, here are all the different links. Um, so the organizational sign-on is um, for any organization, mutual aid group, anything like that, to sign on and say you support $50 million for grants for street vendors. Um, and this is so important. We share with all of your networks, any, your friends in the Bay, your friends in San Diego, in you know, Bakersfield, Everybody in California, any organization should be signing on to this. Um, and this will help vendors across the state. It's not just Los Angeles. And we're making it, we're, we're trying to build it so that it's, it's um, not prohibitive to get the money, make sure that it goes for vendors who are, um, who don't have their permits as well. And that'll be done through community-based organizations who will help get the word out and verify for folks so that people who don't have their permits don't have to worry about any of that stuff because the other processes were so difficult to get through and required so much documentation. Um, so the more people who send these emails and sign the petition, as well as the folks who sign on through the organizations to this letter, the better. This process is gonna be happening over the next couple of weeks. And so we are sending, we're working with the city of LA to actually advocate for this $50 million and we'll be sending updated information to the state as it comes in. Thank you, Lyric. Um, I want to open it up if the audience has any questions for any of our panelists. I don't see. Um, OK, so there's no questions. Well, I, uh, we have a few minutes left and I see Caridad who's itching to speak. And then Caridad. Uh, disculpa, le quiero hacer una pregunta a la, a, 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 a esta, ¿cómo se llama? A la niña, a Lery. ¿Sí? Pues, mija, me, me estás dando una información que estoy tan contenta que nos van a ayudar y para mí es una satisfacción que, que van a involucrar todo el Estado. Y para mí es una noticia tan grande porque, eh, porque ya también, ya ellos ya venden y no están bien informados. Y qué bueno lo que estás diciendo, ¿por qué? Porque eso nos va a ayudar también. Que otros estados vengan hacia nosotros y pidan información. ¿Cómo se va a involucrar esta organización de vendedores? Porque estamos en, esta, estamos en el estado de California. Y para mí... Está muy buena esta información que están dando ustedes, que ya involucremos todo California, no nomás aquí. Gracias. Anyone else would like to leave some final words? Well, thank you, everyone. Um, again, I'm so honored to, to share this space with you and for your time, your knowledge, your creativity. And um, Caridad, adelante. And adelante, a vendedores en acción. Gracias, gracias, gracias a ustedes. If we can share the last slide. These are a few ways that you can um, immediately support street vendors. You can uh, support vendedores en acción through the Bitly uh, page, or you can send a check directly to Inclusive Action. And you can and just please state that it's for the street vendors and also Venmo donations also accepted through inclusive action. Please note that it's for street vendors. And we will continue to share uh, lyrics uh, information that she shared to how to push and advocate for the statewide campaign. We'll be sharing that on social media. So please keep an eye out. 
And for um, those who really enjoyed and support the street vendors, please share this film with other friends and get you know everyone on board to help and continue pushing the advocacy work for the street vendors. Um, there are over 10,000 street vendors in, in LA County and, and they all need your support. They're uh, a gem and such a big uh, contributor to our culture, our society and our economy. Thank you everyone and have a good night.